of what you would say at your funeral. Sounds bizarre, doesn't it? Well, AI technology has made it possible to ask questions to someone who has passed away. Don't you believe me? Well, take a look at this report. I said to my funeral, I'm so pleased that I met so many good people who influenced my life, and I had a happy family life, I had a husband, and a female I was planned in that, I know why he won, and I feel he's coming to conclusion under his guidance, because my work here is completed. Eighty-seven year old Maureen Smith died in June, but through an artificial intelligence tool developed by her son and his wife, a family can still hear her thoughts on any questions they may have. Mourners at Smith's funeral were able to ask the diseased some questions with the story file software accessing recorded video clips of Marina that answered their questions. How did becoming a grandparent change you? I think it brought a new story into my life. And uh, I think just the core conservation of what I do the company, I had great places and share and the beautiful little things with God or a child sit now. And I simply trust him. It's very, very beautiful. So what I think about is, so how can we be better ancestors? How can we tell our story? Because each of our stories of our lives is important to those that follow us. It's interesting for them, actually. The process involves the subject using any laptop to record themselves answering dozens of questions, which are then uploaded to the story file platform. AI selects answers to questions pre-recorded and approved by the subject. It does not defake the answers. People ask about the technology of story from. So when we hear people hear AI, they assume that AI means that we are somehow or other creating this character and all the content. Actually, we do use artificial intelligence, but it's not for creating new content or putting words into your mouth. What we're actually doing is using the AI to search the content, the answers to questions that you give, to get the most appropriate response. Storyfile doesn't change answers to questions. We don't edit it, we don't manipulate it, we don't deepfake it. What we're trying to say is, this is the authentic you, this is the video that you created, and now you're making that accessible by means of conversation for the future. So, in a nutshell, Storyfile is a place that you go to tell your story so that future generations can get to know you and converse with you just like we're talking now. The original idea was to allow interactions with people with notable histories like 9-11 survivors or civil rights leaders. But now, anyone can upload the answers for a one-off fee of $48. What is your message for the future? I would say really, if you have a cool face, and you won't in it, I feel that your life will be full of joy and peace and love. And I would advise, I would really suggest that there's no other way. There's only one way. Walk in it. You keep walking on. What surprised me the most about Alexa is the companionship relationship we have with it. In this companionship role, human attributes of empathy and affect are key for building trust. These attributes have become even more important in these times of the ongoing pandemic when so many of us have lost someone we love. While AI can't eliminate that pain of loss, it can definitely make their memories last. Let's take a look on one of the new capabilities we are working on which enables lasting personal relationships. Alexa, can Grandma finish reading me The Wizard of Oz? Okay. But how about my courage? Ask the lion anxiously. 
You have plenty of courage, I am sure, answered Oz. All you need is confidence in yourself. As you saw in this experience, instead of Alexa's voice reading the book, it's the kid's grandma's voice. This required invention where we had to learn to produce a high quality voice with less than a minute of recording versus hours of recording in a studio. The way we made it happen is by framing the problem as a voice conversion task and not a speech generation task. We are unquestionably living in the golden era of AI, where our dreams and science fiction are becoming a reality. I am optimistic that ambient intelligence enabled through advances in generalizable AI... Amazon is developing a mechanism for people to communicate with their deceased family members. Rohit Prasad, senior vice president and lead scientist for the Alexa team, gave an overview of a technology that allows the voice assistant to mimic a particular human voice on Wednesday at Amazon's Mars conference in Las Vegas. Alexa, can grandma finish reading me The Wizard of Oz, a youngster asked in a demonstration video. After confirming the request in her standard, robotic voice, Alexa abruptly changed to a softer, more human-like tone that seemed to imitate the child's relative. Alexa, can grandma finish reading me The Wizard of Oz? Okay. But how about my courage? Asked the lion anxiously. You have plenty of courage, I am sure, answered Oz. All you need is confidence in yourself. With less than a minute of recorded audio, the Alexa team created a model that enables its voice assistant to deliver a high quality voice, according to Prasad. Amazon did not specify a release date for the functionality. Prasad stated that it may be used to assist honor a dead family member, even if it could potentially be used to imitate any voice. Given that so many of us have lost someone we love due to the COVID-19 epidemic, Prasad added, making artificial intelligence conversative and companion-like has become a major goal. While AI can't take away the grief of loss, it can make memories linger, he continued. The e-commerce behemoth aims to make speaking with Alexa more natural overall, so it has released a number of features that let its voice assistant mimic more human-like conversation, even to the extent of posing questions to the user. What does the Bible say about praying to the dead? We're going to answer that question. Praying to the dead is strictly forbidden in the Bible. Deuteronomy tells us anyone who consults with the dead is detestable to the Lord. The story of Saul consulting a medium to bring up the spirit of the dead Samuel resulted in his death because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord and even consulted a medium for guidance. Clearly, God has declared that such things are not to be done. Consider the characteristics of God. God is omnipresent, everywhere at once, and is capable of hearing every prayer in the world. A human being, on the other hand, does not possess this attribute. Also, God is the only one with the power to answer prayer. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. Certainly, this is an attribute a human being, dead or alive, does not possess. And finally, God is omniscient. He knows everything. Even before we pray, God knows our genuine needs and knows them better than we do. Not only does He know our needs, but He answers our prayers according to His perfect will. So in order for a dead person to receive prayers, the dead individual has to hear the prayer, possess the power to answer it, and know how to answer it in a way that is best for the individual praying. Only God hears and answers prayer because of His perfect essence and because of what some theologians call His eminence. Eminence is the quality of God that causes Him to be directly involved with the affairs of mankind. This includes answering prayer. Even after a person dies, God is still involved with that person in his destination. Man is destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. If a person dies in Christ, he goes to heaven to be present with the Lord. If a person dies in his sin, he goes to hell, and eventually everyone in hell will be thrown into the lake of fire. God has provided his Son, Jesus Christ, to be the mediator between man and and God. With Jesus Christ as our mediator, we can go through Jesus to God. Why would we want to go through a sinful, dead individual, especially when doing so risks the wrath of God? 
That answers the question, what does the Bible say about praying to the dead? There is a very interesting question that came up, and I, I want to read it to you. It's a little lengthy. She said, I've heard you say that it makes it clear in the Bible that it is wrong to talk to the dead. Now, I want to make that clear. Necromancy, divination, the magical arts, uh, fortune telling, soothsaying, all of those are included in many scriptures that refer to them as an abomination to God. Communicating with the dead, necromancy is one of them. She said, um, but what if they're talking to you first? Throughout my life, I've had many, many spirits speak to me, and I can't help but speak back. Well, that's your first mistake, speaking back. If you have spirits that are speaking to you, they are evil spirits. The only way God speaks to us today is through his word, his scriptures, his holy word. They contain everything you need to know about how to live your life. They are profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and for instruction in righteousness. You don't need anything else, tarot cards, spirits, etc. So if they are speaking to you, if spirits are initiating conversations, with you. This is simply what the Bible calls demonic oppression. Now you notice I didn't say demonic possession. Satan cannot possess a believer. Later in your email you claim to love the Lord Jesus Christ. You claim you are devoutly following him. But you're confused. Why are these spirits speaking to you? And ever since you were a little girl these spirits have been speaking to you. You talk about how they chase you around the house. Uh, they do things to make themselves uh, evident. And and you, you present a very real picture of what I would refer to as demonic oppression. This is to be resisted. Uh, there was a girl in Acts chapter 16. The Bible says that she was following the Apostle Paul around. And she would say to, she would say to everybody who would listen, listen to him. He's preaching the gospel. That's my translation now. Acts chapter 16 beginning with verse 16, it says that this girl was demon-possessed. She followed Paul around everywhere he went, and she would say he is declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, she may have been doing so in a mocking way, but either way, Paul turns suddenly to her, calls the demons out of her, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ extracts those demons from her. One thing is clear. What she was saying about Paul was true. He is preaching the gospel. But the spirit with which she was speaking it was demonic in nature. And Paul recognized that and extracted the demon from her. Well, now, I think it's important for you to know there are steps of action you need to take when you are confronted by these demonic spirits. We live in that spirit world. It's all around us. If we could lift the veil of the physical world in which we live right now that separates us from the spiritual world, you would see uh, demonic spirits, you would see angels, good spirits, evil spirits. They're all around us. There's a, an invisible war that is going on all around us. You can see it in our world, in our geopolitical systems. It's all around us. And, and that is what I believe is happening to you. But there's a remedy for it. In... Uh, the book of James, chapter 4, uh, James says this, He, being Christ, gives more grace. Therefore it says, God oppose, opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He opposes, treats as an enemy, the proud. But the channel of grace comes through a humble spirit. Now a humble spirit does not confront demons head on. A humble spirit knows that you are no match for those demons. Only Christ can confront those demons. Well, how do we do that? He continues. He says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Keep on submitting yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Well, how do you resist him? James continues. You resist him this way. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. In other words, Satan is a bully, 
And the only one that can deal with that bully is Christ. So you draw near to Christ and he will draw near to you. Well, now how do you draw near to God? He continues, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves, therefore, before the Lord, and he will exalt you. In other words, when Satan presents himself this way to you, you are to draw near to God through his word, through the scriptures. Put those scriptures up in your mind. Memorize those scriptures. Memorize scriptures that tell you to resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Memorize scriptures that talk about temptation, and, and how you are to resist temptation, and how you are to draw nigh unto God by way of his word. And then when Satan presents himself, you use those scriptures, you pull them out as the means by which you draw near to God. And what happens? God, in turn, the Lord Jesus Christ, your big brother, stands in front of you between you and that evil spirit. And he handles the bully. I think it's also very important for you not to communicate back. You should never, ever, if you sense these spirits around you, if you're sitting down, stand up. If you're standing up, walk. If you're walking, run. If you're running, keep running. Keep moving away from the source of that temptation, no matter how it presents itself. And keep throwing back at Satan the fact that you are drawing nigh unto God by way of his word. Memorize Psalm 1. Put Psalm 1 in your mind where it talks about uh, the, the blessing that comes from uh, the tree that is flourishing because it's drawn near in meditation to God. Uh, memorize James chapter 4 or, or memorize 1 Peter chapter 4 where it talks about different aspects of demonic oppression. And when you begin to communicate with these spirits, you are subjecting yourself more and more and more to his control. That's why this has been going on in your case for years. And you've got to resist the temptation to talk back, uh, to communicate, because it's clearly forbidden in Scripture.